So now I'll get into this energetic model of healing that both yoga and particularly Amazonian plant medicine shamanism have in common. Both the yogi and the ayahuasca shaman, they understand that trauma affects us on a subtle level, causing disturbances and blockages in our energy system. The blockages and disturbances in the subtle body manifest as the mental and distress and physical illness that we associate with the effects of trauma here in the West. Um, and this is one of the things that I found is kind of like evidence I've been collecting over the years. And this really struck me. So on the left, you can all see that drawing. So on the left is a drawing by a uh, Amazonian ayahuasca shaman when he was asked by an anthropologist to draw what he sees when he looks at a person while he's under the influence of ayahuasca. So to get a sense of like what he's doing in this ceremony with his healing work. And so on the left, we've got a, a person and they've got all of these lines around them, wavy lines, uh, crooked kind of line going down their center. So you get a sense that it's depicting an energy disturbance. Energy is not contained in the body. It's just uh, disturbed and incoherent. And then on the right, he's got the figure. It was just, it's a basic stick figure. So what they do in the ceremony is they straighten out people's energy using the plant medicine and their singing. And then on the right, we've got a drawing from one of Desikachar's books depicting the exact same thing. And I love Desikachar because he really gets down to the essence of things and communicates in a really simple and clear way. And it's kind of sweet, actually, how kind of simple and clear it is. Um, so on the left, we've got another figure with these wavy lines all around them. And it says prana outside the body. And that makes for an agitated person. <laughs> and then next to him is showing a figure with the prana all consolidated within the body. And it says quiet person. So the difference between an agitated person and a quiet person is that their prana, their life energy is contained in their body or it's not. And I just love that he uses the word agitated person, you know, like in yoga and shamanism, there's no word equivalent to trauma really. And trauma has become a really big and heavy and powerful word in our culture. Uh, but really, what is it? It's, you're agitated, you know, things affect you maybe a little more deeply in your life. You respond to life situations in a way that's not appropriate to the actual situation and it agitates you, it disturbs you. I just love that, you know, let's keep it simple. So you're either agitated or you're kind of a quiet and calm person, you know, and we all, I think, want to be more quiet and calm, less agitated people. That's why we're here. So their method of treatment is to go straight to the root cause and restore the balance and flow of energy in the subtle body. Pretty simple. We don't talk about it a lot. We don't talk about what happened. The, the shaman looks at you, sees that you're agitated, that your energy is disturbed, and they'll go in and they'll just try to straighten out your energy. They don't want to hear your story. And I'd say the same of the yogi. Um, there's not a lot of time spent on telling our story. Because in yoga, there's uh, this concept of samskara, which is a mental, emotional impression. And everything in our life creates a samskara to a certain degree. So the more powerful the experience, good or bad, will create a deeper samskara, a deeper impression, um, good or bad. And so the more that we go over that experience, the deeper the samskara gets. So if it's a good experience, well, yes, that's a nice samskara to have, like a, a nice association with a person, you know, so I, every time I remember my teachers that I love, it deepens that samskara and it stays with me, you know, it's more kind of persistent and available to me. Um, you know, a, a beautiful memory I had of going to the beach when I was a kid, you know, every time I remember that it deepens the samskara. And so that's a nice thing to have. Um, you can return to it really easily because the samskara is there. But adverse experiences, the more we go over them, they'll also deepen that impression. 
And the more present and available it will be to your consciousness. And the more apt you are to react to that impression in, that happened in the past in the present day. So not a lot of emphasis placed on repeating stories to going back to the origin of what happened, really trying to address how it's affected you in the here and now and to take care of you on that energetic level. So beyond the mind, the mind is actually seen as an obstacle to doing the deep healing work. So very different from the kind of conventional Western psychotherapeutic approach. This is a quote from a German anthropologist who studied the Shipibo Kinibo people and their methods of healing. The shaman sees the otherwise invisible body patterns of the patient sitting or recumbent in front of him. The state of these patterns tells him something about the patient's condition. Patterns of individuals who are ill are twisted or destroyed. The shaman orders this pattern. He repairs it with his singing. The song texts say that the patterns are ordered, made straight, or redirected. Body patterns represent a Shipibo's psychic and physical integrity. Shamans call this restoration of the body pattern, which is a metaphor for healing, calling back the soul. I just want to point out, he uses the word metaphor here. He says that this ordering of the energetic pattern in the patient is a metaphor for healing. I just want to point out that that's an anthropologist's viewpoint, a Westerner's viewpoint. For the Shipibo people, it's not a metaphor. This is exactly what they're doing. It's what they see, how they experience these disturbances, and how they uh, approach healing them. So just to say that, you know, the Western idea that these things are metaphors or they're superstitious or they're imaginal is a way of kind of discounting the experience of the, in this case, the Shipibo healer. So this is uh, an example of some of the depictions of these energetic patterns once they're ordered. So this is a Shipibo art form called Kene. And this is the kind of thing that the uh, women healers would be embroidering while they're like lying in the hammock in between ceremonies. And they would have these giant tapestries laid out on their lap doing this intricate embroidery. And they're gossiping with their friends and they're smoking mapachos, the jungle tobacco, and just having a great time. And they would say that these patterns actually depict the healing songs that they sing. So the songs of the plants and um, kind of the legend is, is that a, a master healer could look at one of these patterns and actually sing that song to recognize the plant, the spirit that this pattern represents. So it's really kind of uh, South American yantra. So the, the main difference that I, I see between the, the shaman and the yogi is that while the shaman does the energetic restoration for their patients, the yogi does it for him or herself. This is Desikachar. The idea of prana existing within or beyond the body can be understood as a symbol for our state of mind. If we notice hesitancy, discontent, fear of doing something because it might be inappropriate and so forth, we can assume that there are blockages in the system. These blockages do not just occur in the physical body, they exist even more in the mind, in consciousness. Again, echoing that idea of blockages, disturbances. Too little prana in the body can be expressed as a feeling of being stuck or restricted. It can also show as a lack of drive or motivation to do anything. We are listless and even depressed. We may suffer from physical ailments when prana is lacking in the body. The idea that yogis are people who carry all their prana within their body, therefore means that they are their own masters. So again, we can hear echoes in the way Deskachar describes uh, prana blockages and disturbances, how they affect us on physical, mental, emotional levels, um, and really getting to the core. Well, what do we do with that? Well, we want to consolidate the prana. We want to get the prana back in the body. And this is a great little illustration of that from his book, The Heart of Yoga. So on the left, we can see someone, their prana is dispersed. It's, it's uh, leaving the body, it's not contained. 
And I think we can all relate to this if we think about times when we're overwhelmed with to-do lists, uh, the phone notifications, maybe we've got different conversations happening on the phone, we've got things we got to take care of in the house, we're thinking of all these things, all those things we're projecting our mental energy, and therefore our prana out into the world. And we know how we feel when we get that way, we can feel quite agitated, not so quiet. Um, and then on the right, it's showing a figure with the prana contained in the body. So the prana is still flowing out from the heart, but it's contained and consolidated in the body. So we can summarize by saying the goal of yoga practice is to remove energetic blockages and concentrate prana in the body using breath, awareness, and sound. And this leads to physical health, mental clarity, and ultimately liberation. And when I say liberation, I'm talking about liberation of the soul from the mental constructs of the mind. So we move from being identified with the constructs of the mind, so with the ego, to identifying with the soul, seeing ego as just one part of who we are as a whole. It's the part that helps us function in the world. It's the part that we show to the world and we is the means of interacting with the world, but it's just one part. At our core, we are a soul. And these are some artistic depictions of the energetic pathways of prana, of chakras. And I include this to show that there's nothing, there's no consensus on any of this stuff in the shamanic world or in the yogic world. There are so many different depictions, so many different models of how energy functions in the body. Really what we're seeing here is an attempt by the practitioner to describe what they're experiencing in their practice. And so these are the kind of images that come to practitioners. They have a revelation. Oh, okay, this is what prana is in my body. I feel all of these channels opening up and flowing. And then they try to describe it to others. And somebody picks up on it and passes it along. Um, you know, another practitioner will have a different experience of what's going on in their body when they're practicing. And so we'll have a different image and a different model. And we can see this throughout the yoga tradition. We think about something like the chakras. Uh, there's kind of a common idea that there are seven chakras and they have all of these names and associated mantras and they affect us on this uh, physical, emotional or psychic level. But really, um, there's just no consensus on it at all. Some systems talk about three chakras, some talk about five, some talk about nine, some talk about 11. Really, it's not about um, codifying something to that degree. We have this uh, tendency in the West to want to like distill everything down and so that we think we know it, right? And so we whittle it down to a kind of codified system and then we think we've mastered it. So we know all the names of the chakras, we know how they function, we know the practices to do to open up those chakras, but really that's just a fantasy. And it's a kind of Western fantasy of mastery. Um, when you really look at the tradition, there's no consensus, there's different stories, different images about how all of this stuff works. Look at any particular topic, Kundalini, chakras, prana, and you'll get so many different stories that'll boggle your mind. So as a practitioner, what we want to do, I think, is to have an open mind and to take these images as exactly that, you know, one person's experience of what happens when they practice. And those can give us images for us to work with, to make our practice more meaningful, to help us engage in the practice more deeply. But I think we should also be open to finding our own images for what's going on. And so as we do the practice, we might have a different experience of the chakras or of the nadis, the energetic pathways. And I think we should really stay open to those images because they're coming from someplace deep within us. And they're as relevant as any of the other images. Just because those images are old doesn't mean they're the only truth, right? 
we look at the whole arc of the yoga tradition, things are always changing. New images are coming in, new ideas are coming in about how these practices work. Um, and so we can also continue on with that natural evolution of the practice by being open and honoring the images that come to us in our practice. So in recent years, there's been a growing awareness and acceptance of the energetic aspects of healing trauma within Western therapies. This is uh, trauma specialist Peter Levine, who wrote an influential book called Waking the Tiger. And uh, he has been an influence on one of my teachers, Gabor Mate. Uh, he's been doing trauma work for like over 40 years. So he's a really well-respected authority on trauma. And he says, trauma symptoms are not caused by the triggering event itself. They stem from the frozen residue of energy that has not been resolved and discharged. This residue remains trapped in the nervous system where it can wreak havoc on our bodies and spirits. Ah, so somebody is getting it here. So I think this is encouraging, but really, at the end of the day, it just merely affirms what shamans and yogis have known for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. So for me, being a practitioner, really being into and honoring that direct experience, when I hear, um, you know, these new scientific discoveries about things like trauma, uh, for me, what I can always see how they're just reiterating something that I already know from these other older traditions. And I think it's a kind of like Western arrogance that keeps um, them from just honoring the old traditions who have been working on this stuff for many, many, many generations. You know, these these practices would not continue if they weren't effective. Right. If they didn't work, they wouldn't be passed on for generations. They'd just be forgotten about and discarded. You know, people who are living, um, you know, in the jungle or in rural India, they don't have time for things that don't actually work. You know, they're not going to do a practice unless it actually heals you. So I trust that, you know, time tested and true. And, you know, I can't wait for science to catch up. I'd rather just go and do the practices, learn from the traditions and get on with it and empower myself with a practice that works. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Hat Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makashchi Dukkha Bhagbhavet Om Shanti 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 Shanti